Hello and welcome to today's webinar, EU Smart Home Appliance and IoT Industry Growth by 2027. So it's all about standardization, security, regulation and supply chain challenges. My name is Claire Forestier, I'm your host today. I've been brought in by HQTS who are sponsoring today's event. So HQTS have been providing quality assurance services around the world for more than 25 years. They've been headquartered in Asia, but they're located in a number of countries across the globe. HQTS provides supply chain quality solutions for commercial and consumer goods, as well as testing services, inspections, audits and certifications. And they also take care of the production process management, production monitoring, training, and they offer consulting to their clients across a huge number of verticals. So I'd like to introduce today's speakers to you now, if I may. So first of all, we're going to be joined by Ian Bell from Euromonitor International. So hi, Ian. Hopefully you'll be oh, yeah. popping How are you up. Doing today? There you go. Hi, nice to see you. Um, tell us about your background in the subject today. Um, well, look, I've been involved in home technology for about a decade now, and I'm in Euromonitor, I'm what they call a global lead, which probably doesn't mean much to many people, but I really look at the junction between traditional FMCG, like think about a laundry detergent, but yeah. also think about how that interacts with the appliance, how that interacts with apparel. And if you find that middle ground between all those different industries, that's where I am. Brilliant, perfect. So you should be absolute perfect person to talk to us today. You're going to be giving us an overview of the smart home appliance industry. Thank you very much. But before we hear your presentation, um, I'd like to introduce you to two more guests. Our second speaker is Paolo Falcioni, Director of Home Appliance Europe. I hope I said your name right, Paolo. Nice to meet you. Very, very well. Uh, excellent pronunciation. It's a pleasure for mm -hmm. me to be here. And um, uh, me, I am the Director General for Aplia, who represents the home appliance industry in Europe. So any company between A, Archelic and W, Whirlpool and everything that is in between. And uh, uh, it, it's my pleasure to participate to today's webinar. Brilliant. So you're right you, in the heart. You're right in the heart of it. Great. So we're going to hear more from Paolo later because he's going to be talking to us about the challenges and the legislation involved. And our third speaker today is Alexandra, oh gosh, your beautiful name too, Alexandra Deschamps. So how do I say your last name? Say your full name for me. It, it's Deschamps Sonsino, but that's all right. Don't worry. It's always <laughs> uh, quite long and quite complicated for most people. <laughs> beautiful name. So Alex is going to be talking about security in the smart home, but you're the author of the book, Smarter Home, How Technology Will Change Your Life. How did you get into all this? What's your background? So my background, um, right now I work as a consultant. I come from the world of design, industrial design, interaction design, and I was the first UK distributor of the Arduino, which some of you may or may not be familiar with as um, another open source educational platform like Raspberry Pi. Oh, wow. Okay. So again, both of, all of our speakers have real background in this and, and real knowledge. So it's going to be fascinating hearing what you have to say. We're going to hear from them all individually and then do some questions in between. And then we're going to move on to a Q&A session with you, the audience. So we have got some questions from you already, but it, we'd love it if you use the Q&A function here on Zoom to ask your own questions. If you're not familiar with it yet, just click onto it, ask your question. And if someone else has actually already asked it, you can upvote to make sure it really gets to our attention. If you don't get through, if we don't get through all the questions, please don't worry, please put them in the chat and we will try and get the speakers to get back to you afterwards. We will gather all their answers and get them back to you afterwards. And of course, put your company name and email in as well. So HQTS can get back to you and also can send you the recording if you'd like it. So Ian is up first with a presentation that will give us an overview of the industry and the future for the sector post COVID. The rest of us are gonna switch off our cameras and microphones for now and leave you alone on the stage, so to speak. So take it away, Ian. Thank you very much. Well, hopefully you can see my screen. You should see a slide that says World and European Appliance Trends. So I'm going to assume this is all working. So let's go ahead. Right then. I Mind can't see your screen yet, Ian. You can't see my screen yet. Okay. No. Just bear with me a second. Apologies. Technology oh, being technology. Oh, I know. Share screen. Share this one. Share. Right. Yes. 
Okay, right then, we're, we're ready to go. But it's in your main post, it's in your main... Um, I'm going to put it on screen. the screen. Yeah. There you go. Brilliant. Go. <laughs> I'll leave you to it. All good, right then. Um, I'll be honest with you, this is the first time I've worn a tie since March. So things have changed. Why, why am I so uncomfortable? Well, I feel a little bit uncomfortable. Well, why is this unusual for me? And the thing is, that we're going to look at global market, global pandemic. And the core here is that to think about everyday items, door handles. I didn't used to think about door handles before, but now I clean them. And our relationship with everyday items has changed because of pandemic. And I don't want to make this presentation just about the pandemic, but it is, it's critical for you to understand how the pandemic has changed consumer attitude to everyday items, not just in Europe, but all around the world. Um, touch screens. We really thought touch screens were the thing and in store, really handy. Do consumers still feel the same way about touch screens that they did before the pandemic? Will they continue to think that they're convenient and useful items? That's a good question for you. Also about hand hygiene, personal hygiene. Previously, we had this um, an idea that consumers are very reluctant to take on board consumer education advice. For businesses, it's very expensive and it doesn't really work. But in the event of the pandemic, things have changed really, really fundamentally. So my understanding of hand hygiene and how I look after myself personally in, in the context of the, the pandemic has changed fundamentally. And that's something which I know this doesn't really seem like it talks about connected appliances, but it does. And I'll explain that to you as we go through this presentation. So the, the fundamental question I've had from all our clients all around the world, whether it is about home care products or about appliance products, has been about how does this pandemic compare with the global financial crisis of back in 2008, 2009? So I put together this chart and it should show you that actually this is fundamentally different from the, from the financial crisis, the pandemic. We're forecasting and we've got lots of different forecasting models that produce lots of different results. But this is kind of the global environment that we're predicting, which is a deep V and significant economic um, difficulty coming from 2001 and through 2025, 2000, 2021 through to 2025. That's kind of what I'm predicting. I think this is the best case scenario. I think it's personally, I think it's going to be worse than this, but there's still opportunities out there. What I would say is how, how does uh, appliances behave or perform compared to other industries. And this is just focusing on 2020. It's not it's not great, but it's not as bad as personal accessories, apparel, luxury goods, eyewear. We've got still a, a platform to build on. And the question that we had from the industry is like, how did the how did performance compare with what we saw in the um, financial crisis? So the three questions that I think are fundamentally important. It's like, how big is the recession that we're facing in Europe, but globally? That's a key question that we still don't have the full answers to. Um, how much demand, because consumers have been in lockdown, how much of the demand is going to be delayed? And we're going to receive that demand a little bit later on, all those purchases. And also, this is the fundamental factor for me for small connected appliances. How has consumer behavior been changed? And what does that mean for demand now and in the future? So the third question is the fundamental question for me. And that is the question that I'm going to try and answer or give you some guidance on over the next 10 or so minutes. So fundamentally, when we asked about the question about how do we perform compared to the financial crisis, for me, that's the wrong question. The right question is, how do we perform how does businesses operate in a period of crisis? Now, we've done a lot of work on water crisis, and it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic example from South Africa, which is they went from this period of abundance of water where you could fill your swimming pool, everything was fantastic. Then they went to crisis where it was literally a day where the taps were going to run dry. And how did consumers cope with that? What was their reaction to that? And the reaction to that was they went from abundance to crisis 
they didn't go back to abundance again when things were all right. They went back to this, this period of time where they're now in compromise. And what I'm going to say to the industry is now through 2025 and probably after, consumers are going to be in this compromised psychology. And this is something we can help with. And smart connected technology can be a major component in helping consumers to navigate through this, what is going to be a difficult period for them. Previously, voice control. I was skeptical, but if we look at voice control now, we want to speak to appliances. Why did I want to speak to a, a faucet or a tap previously just for water? It didn't make any sense to me. Now it makes perfect sense. So voice control has got a huge opportunity now and in the future to make it, uh, to play a bigger role in consumers' lives. How we consume food, how we socialize is a huge opportunity for smart connected appliances. How can we facilitate these new uh, lifestyles of consumers? Also think about the home, indoor, outdoor space. How is it going to be different now and in the future? How are new homes going to be designed? All the information we have about COVID is going to influence home and lifestyle. And that's a significant area for consideration about how to tap into consumers and what they're really looking for. Also, sustainability. It hasn't gone off the agenda. It's still there. Sustainability is going to come back in a big way. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But don't forget sustainability. Energy bills, critical for consumers. Now, if you've got job insecurity and you've got a huge energy bill, that's stress. How can we help? And again, with energy, if you think about the long-term future, the culmination of energy being a key factor, legislation, the electrification of personal transport is going to mean that energy is going to be the critical factor for consumers in the future. And energy systems, connected systems, are going to be fundamental to the way that we live our lives in the future. Do you have technology? Do you have products which speak to that? If you do, then you're in a very good place. Now, I've talked globally and very generally, but let's talk about European. Um, I'm not going to talk about Brexit. I'm tired of talking about Brexit. So let's just pretend that the UK is still within the European Union. The European trend is very similar to the global trend. You'll see that we're predicting very low growth, value growth for consumer appliances, both small and um, large still opportunities there. The Euro European market is still significant. There's still a lot of opportunity and, and opportunity to, to grow. I would say that the European market where we've seen generally low growth rates and we're forecasting low growth rates, uh, connected smart appliances still outperform the market in every category significantly. I would say that for the European market, we need to think about the macro economy. And when we think about the macroeconomy, we need to think about consumer's disposable income, we need to think about unemployment, consumer confidence, stimulus packages that, that the, the governments are going to introduce, taxation and interest rates. This is fundamental to the, to the shape of the European market over the short to medium and even long term. Um, one of the key areas I want to suggest or want to highlight to you is that um, IFA, which is the probably the biggest trade show in the world for consumer appliances and also for um, electronics. We had the key takeaway in 2020 was five by five, which suggested in five months previous to IFA, which happened in September this year, we had five years of development and the, the industry has been incredibly flexible and also distribution has been incredibly flexible at facing the challenges of the pandemic. So what does that mean? It means that the industry is incredibly flexible and has really proved itself to be so, but the pandemic is incredibly slow moving. So as the pandemic takes longer to um, rectify itself, let's say, the industry really is, is being penned back by that. And I think that we, we have two different speeds. Pandemic is slow, industry is fast. That's something to take into account longer term. And this is also going to affect consumers' key purchasing priorities. In this situation, with unemployment, with difficult economic situation, how is this going to affect consumers' key purchasing factors? That's something to consider and something we can help you with. 
also supply chain. Online operations has grown, lower store dependence, even store closures. So all the showrooming that we were do, doing before may, may not be a factor in the future. And we can see that non-store across the EU27 has grown fantastically. Now, the key thing is to look at the red line versus the blue line. That's 2019 versus 2020. So again, that goes back to five years development in, in literally five months or one year in this case. In terms of e-commerce as a share of uh, consumer appliances, we can see that China is by far in a way the leader, but there is a lot of opportunity. If you see the European markets, they're quite low. Greece, Spain, Romania, France. There's a huge opportunity there to embrace online for these type of consumers. What doesn't work for them? How can we embrace them in the online environment? Also for the consumer. Consumer is working from home more often, more meals in the home, more time spent in the home. Service industry, you may notice I haven't had a haircut for some time, and actually I cut my own hair now. So how can appliances help me with that? The rise of do-it-yourself, increasing appliance usage means that my appliances are going to break down more, to, uh, more often. So every time I open the refrigerator, which is more often than before, the compressor is working. So it means it needs to be replaced. What can I replace that appliance with? And what I would say with um, smart connected appliances is we've, we've gone through this period where often smart connected appliances have been about push. We have this technology and let's get consumers to buy it. 3D television, Google glasses, for example. But what we really need to think about is what do consumers really want? And this is the critical fact of smart connected appliances. If you have pull technology that consumers really want, and it really makes a difference to their lifestyles in this really complicated and changing environment. So what I want to say to you is Europe, smart connected appliances are still a very small portion of what's being sold at the moment. You can see in comparison with the US, South Korea and China, still a small proportion. This for me is opportunity. There's a huge opportunity here, untapped opportunity in connected appliances that speak to consumers and it has to be pull technology which speaks to them, speaks to their environment. And there's nothing better than this strange period that we're in at the moment where consumers feel uncomfortable, feel it's a difficult period. So this is an opportunity. And also this percentage of volume of smart connected appliances you can see that, look at these, these, these list of names, Portugal, Spain, Greece. Why do they have such a high percentage of small connected appliances? This comes to the fact that air conditioning, air treatment appliances have really embraced small connected in a way that other air industry areas haven't. So if Portugal, Greece and Spain can have such a high proportion of small connected appliances because it relates to air care, what do the other industry sectors need to do to be able to embrace or tap into this latent consumer demand in the European market. So I'm going to try and wrap up now that sustainability, we talked about that earlier, sustainability, do consumers really care about sustainability? Well, just, just wait until they see the electricity bills, then they'll start to care about sustainability. So if you can do efficiency with energy, then you're in a good place. But what about hygiene? Consumers are really fascinated by hygiene at the moment. Can you and add hygiene to your proposition. How about food? How can you help consumers to make the right choices when it comes to food? Healthy, use less, waste less. It's a critical point. How can Smart Connected help in this area? And also about legislation. European is a highly legis um, um, legislated market. How do you fit within the legislation that exists within the European market? That's a critical question. You need to abide by this or the European market is out of reach for you. And finally, I've tried to put the world and European market trends it all in 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to do so. There's so much to pack in here. I can't achieve it. I am open to questions from anybody, whether it was within this format or afterwards. I'm more than happy to answer any questions about specifics about category or specific industries. So please do not refrain from asking me questions. And I thank you for your time this morning. And I hand you back over to our. Hi, lovely to see you. Okay, so if you should stop sharing the screen. Okay. And I will just ask Paolo and Alexandra to join us again quickly to a couple of questions. 
Well, you, you did touch on that, the energy efficiency matters so much. Why does it matter so much in the EU? Is it generally that because people want to keep bills down? There's, there's, there's obviously more to it than that. Well, I still think it's a fundamental visceral. Like, have, you seen, have, have you opened your energy bill recently? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So everybody's got the same, that this is visceral for the consumer. And like, I'll be honest with you, the appliance industry has a problem with trying to like, why is this important for me? You've got this new gadget, but actually it's going to help with my energy bills. It's going to cut greenhouse gas emissions. Like consumers get it. And if you can put a product in that area, which allows you to do that and also achieve good results there, I think that's fundamental for the industry. Like if you can do that, that's, that's magic for the consumer and they will buy into that possibly. That, um, that is the best way forward. Okay. For me, yes. Uh, I wanted to get your opinions, um, Paolo and Alexandra, on, on what you've just heard. What stuck out for you? If I come to you first, Paolo. Yes, uh, I, I noted down a lot of very interesting things. The role of energy bill, which smart connected appliances could help to manage. I noted down uh, the uh, food because the also smart connected appliances could help in managing better the food and the food in the fridge and making the link between the, the fridge and the oven. And also the role of legislation, which I will touch in my presentation. So thank you, Ian. You are kind of pushing my presentation forward. Thanks a lot. No problem Great. at all. You set the agenda well there. What about you, Alexandra? What, what did you, what questions might you have or what were you thinking about? what Ian said. Well, I think it's a very interesting um, overview uh, of a dynamic that I think is highly uh, personal and also highly gendered. I think that people's relationship to their everyday activities uh, in heteronormative households, let's say, um, is split. So who does the buying of the smart appliance? Mm. Who invests in something that is uh, more energy efficient and who is convincing who to make a mm. smart home choice is also a social question. And I think that's also interesting to think about, which is, you know, is it ultimately about selling women more things? Um, or uh, how are we enabling husbands to talk to their wives about making what can be sometimes a very expensive upfront uh, decision? Uh, and it might save you some energy over a period of time, but you know, you're know you asking someone to replace an, a whole appliance. And I think that's a conversation that because it's socially driven and it's uh, financially driven can be very tricky and can lead people to say, oh, next year. And I think that's also a dynamic which we have to understand as designers, which we have to understand as business owners uh, to say, who are we really selling to and what tools are we giving them to convince their families that this is the right thing to do? That's a really can interesting I, point. Yeah, carry can on. Can I just take the point to follow up on that? Alexandra, mm -hmm. I think a critical point is gender politics in relationships is a crucial part of this. It's incredibly complicated. I think the dishwashing industry now, I'm going to speak in very broad terms here, but the dishwashing industry for automatic dishwashers, they know that the block on a purchase for automatic dishwasher generally comes from the male in the relationship. And I'm going to speak very broadly here because they're, they're thinking that if this task which I can do gets replaced by a machine, then what is next for me? Are they, am I going to be made to do the laundry? And I think gender politics is a crucial part of appliances. So I completely agree with you on that. I'm sorry to be laughing because I know it's important. It just it just brings all these <laughs> yeah, things into your too, head of, yes. about your family too. And it's who who knew we'd be talking about gender politics today in the smart home webinar? Brilliant. Well, let, let's move on now. Thank you so much to our second presentation from Paolo Falcioni, giving us more detail into the role of the smart home and the benefits of the energy system and also the challenges. So I'll leave you, Paolo. Thank you, Claire. And. Um... My, uh, my presentation, uh, it is uh, about telling uh, you about uh, the opportunities and, uh, and challenges. And I'm sure that uh, uh, the presentation is going to go uh, live soon, which uh, the, exactly that is, uh, that is coming. Thank you very much. 
and uh, uh, it is uh, for me important to tell you who are we representing in Europe and we do represent uh, uh, world-class home appliance manufacturers in Europe and we have as I said in my short uh, introduction uh, everybody from A. Archelik, a Turkish headquarter company, to Whirlpool, which is based in North America for their headquarter. And actually, what is it the role that Smart Home can play, uh, which we'll see in the next uh, chart? We have two key important roles for uh, smart appliances uh, in the home. Yes, next chart, please. And uh, it is uh, on one side, appliances can help manage the electricity bill by taking advantage of the demand side flexibility in the home. What does it mean? It means that whenever we have a variable supply of energy coming from uh, renewable energy sources, that is pretty much part of the European Union uh, decarbonization goal for uh, 2050 to increase the rate of renewables in the energy generation in order to couple that variable energy generation with the variable demand we need to mobilize the demand and that is exactly what it means that energy smart appliances could participate to this new type of electricity market reducing the uh, bill for consumers and uh, that actually matches very much with what Ian said earlier about the uh, number of air conditioners that are sold in Europe now because and they are more connected than others why because there is more advantage in uh, having uh, air conditioners uh, participate to this new demand side flexibility in the home and then we have the second possibility, which is to have connected appliances. And that is where the uh, hygiene and the food comes into place, because that is the, those are the areas where connected appliances can help in manage better our own everyday lifestyles. And uh, um, in the next chart, uh, I am highlighting the two key uh, benefits for uh, us as individuals. Reduce costs, as we have seen, and bring comfort in, uh, in the home. And that is, uh, in the next chart, the, the role of uh, reducing cost, uh, it is uh, providing a service for the smart grid, which is, which is the next uh, chart, please, where we see that actually consumers are providing a service to the energy distribution network by mobilizing their energy consumption patterns. That is something new, that is something that doesn't uh, rhyme to us as, as consumers because we are used to actually plug our appliances in and then take the energy for granted. But what Ian just said about the electricity cost will make us think twice about what can we actually do in order to minimize our energy bill and participating to the demand side management it is exactly one key aspect should we do something as as consumers but no nobody would want to check the time and say that's the time to turn on and off my stuff appliances are designed already today to take advantage of this variable electricity bill and that is something that will be more and more common in the future uh, those are the opportunities what are the challenges that we see happening and those are highlighted in the next chart where we see that there are three uh, challenges the first it is data ownership we are going uh, toward uh, a data economy therefore who owns data, it's important, it's important. Privacy, clearly each of us has privacy as one of the top concern and having connected appliances, privacy must be guaranteed. And of course, cybersecurity. Nobody would want to have somebody else hacking into the home. And what I will do now, it is to 
say what is it the European Union doing to face the, the three challenges in the next chart, you will see that uh, the European Union, uh, next chart please, it is uh, uh, highlighting uh, three uh, uh, aspects. One is the e-privacy. Um, can you go please to the next chart? I cannot see on my screen. Perfect, thank you very much. So it is uh, uh, e-privacy, which is uh, the legislation being discussed right now, the cybersecurity to uh, make sure that we are secure, and also artificial intelligence, which I've uh, seen already in one of the questions that are uh, coming up. Let me delve each by uh, each uh, topic uh, in the next chart. So in the next one, please, uh, it is, uh, what is it happening on the uh, e-privacy? There is a proposal from uh, the uh, European Commission, which has been uh, uh, discussed in the European Council for quite some time uh, now. Uh, we are toward the end of the German presidency, and uh, they are trying to uh, break the, the deadlock, and uh, there is still some, some hope. Uh, for that. Uh, and to us, even though the e privacy proposal is uh, very well uh, written, there are a couple of challenges that we uh, see coming. First of all, because the, the scope is, is not clear and it should be um, improved. Because for us, as Ian said already, uh, one key aspect for us is predictive maintenance. So we should be able, representing, uh, well, members of, the, of, of our association should be able to enable predictive maintenance. If something is going to happen that may um, prevent uh, the fridge from working well, it is much better to know it in advance rather than having to fix it and having to cope with the downtime. That's what I mean by predictive maintenance. And actually, the e-privacy regulation, as it stands, would not allow for that, which is extremely uh, important. Another key issue for us, it is that the current formulation would allow an end user to postpone or even refuse a security update, while uh, to us it's extremely important when there is a security update that everybody would be able uh, uh, to uh, install it, because it's a matter of enabling uh, the uh, cyber uh, security of all appliances. In the next chart, I will uh, delve into cybersecurity. Um, there is in place a cybersecurity act since June 2019, and uh, it is a voluntary scheme. Um, there are possibilities to use existing standards. What we are aiming at, it is uh, to an European-wide cybersecurity certification framework for digital products, services, and processes. Those are three different schemes that are being developed and that we look forward to, uh, to, to having. Uh, there are also a couple of challenges. Voluntary schemes might become mandatory and uh, that to us is not, is not a good thing then we have to define clearly what does it mean to have different levels of assurance, basic, substantial, or high. Protecting a fridge is different from protecting a bank account. So one would be in the basic, the bank account would be into the uh, high, and that is important to, uh, to, have it, uh, to have it clear. To us, what is clearly extremely important, it is that appliances should be secure by design. And product, that is also extremely important, must remain safe in terms of safety, even if hacked. And that is uh, what we uh, have already today and will have also tomorrow. The third and my uh, last chart, it, it, it is about artificial intelligence. That is a, a particularly important um, topic because it's linked with innovation. A possible artificial intelligence uh, horizontal regulation uh, will be proposed uh, most likely early 2021. And that would be important so that uh, developers would know 
what it is possible and what it is not according to the uh, European Union regulation. There are challenges here. First of all, because we have to understand what we are talking about. Artificial intelligence, uh, it's a, a term uh, which we all know by uh, science fiction movies, but in terms of legislation, we have to know uh, what it means. And uh, what we should definitely avoid, it is an over-regulation which would possibly impair and prevent innovation from uh, taking place. With that, I would like to thank you and pass over the floor to Claire. Thank you. Brilliant. Hi. Thank you so much. So um, just what I think we might do, because we, we, we want to make sure that we get Alexandra's presentation in as well, is to leave the questions for a minute and move straight on to Alexandra and then come back to the questions at the end because I think they'll match some of what we're getting as well from the audience. So um, let's do that. So thank you so much, Paolo. Alexandra, are you happy? Have you got everything you need if I leave you now? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, a typical, typical uh, rookie mistake. Yes, I'm Oh, fine. don't worry. It's phrase, <laughs> I think it is one of those new phrases of the year, isn't it? Most commonly used phrase. Um, okay, I leave you to it. Okay. Let's do this. So, um, thanks. This is hopefully going to follow on from Paolo quite seamlessly. Um, I wanted to share actually something that isn't particularly legally binding, but I think is possibly as inviting in terms of how to think about smart home appliances, but also I think how to think about uh, Internet of Things development. So um, a little bit about me, as I said earlier, and I'm an independent consultant. I'm the author of a book on smart homes. I'm also the author of a book coming out uh, in the next few weeks on innovation. I'm the founder of a connected product for the home, so I have tangible experience of designing uh, for that space. And I was also the curator of the London Internet of Things meetup, which was the second largest meetup in the world around this topic. Um, so I'm coming to this from a variety of perspectives, but um, essentially wanting to think about the challenges of designing for the home when you're designing a connected product. So, Clearly the home has been, I would say, the perfect test tube for connected experiences uh, because they have offered people a wide variety of ways in, whether that was screen-based entertainment devices or work-based devices. So anything with the screen, whether that's your phone, your laptop, your television, um, white goods and other kinds of appliances have also gotten um, smarter or have the potential to get smarter. Um, energy and security sort of come hand in hand because they become more functional aspects of the home, which also attracts people in. And then other more fringe uses of uh, the home and its environment and its habits and the people inside it. And I think that that's um, been a really interesting, it's provided a really interesting way in for a bunch of companies, a bunch of products and a bunch of approaches. Um, it's also meant that there hasn't necessarily been a lot of oversight. So some of the challenges that exist in the space um, are there because it's sort of an open field. You don't need a license to make a smart product. You don't need a professional body to authorize your product beyond basic safety. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that or basic electrical safety or radio safety. And so uh, we've gone from things that are made for a niche audience and an innovator audience to moving into uh, a larger majority of the market. And I think that's provided us with uh, solutions that sometimes are not secure, sometimes are not GDPR compliant because the perception is the user might not be in the EU, um, are sometimes extremely wasteful and have produced poor user experiences simply because the gates to development are not really closed. If you have an engineer on your team and a CTO who knows how to do web dev, uh, you know, you have the authority and, um, uh, you know, nobody's going to stop you from delivering a smart product. So as part of the community in London and across both the US and Europe, we started scratching our head at some of the problems that were starting to occur and developed something called better IoT. 
Better IoT started as a community conversation in 2012 and then moved between 2017 and 19 into an effort to uh, create initially a certification um, pro a certification scheme uh, that you would have to go through in the same way that you might go through CE or UL. Eventually, we dropped the idea of certification in order to give people guidance instead and free and accessible guidance. Um, so the assessment and that guidance includes a bunch of elements, which I'll go through very quickly. Uh, it's worth going to check it out. It's at betteriot.org if you're um, doing that while I'm speaking. Um, one of the first aspects which we look at is the idea of interoperability. Why is that interesting or important? Well, it's interesting and important to think of the home as a series of devices that are brought in at different points that come from different brands and might not talk to each other, but that uh, if they do talk to each other, if they do interoperate, that might produce solutions for the user that they might not otherwise be able to do. Um, developing an API for a product is extremely complicated, it's extremely, it's an investment that not many take, but there are schemes available and people have started building um, those kinds of mechanisms, but it's not a de facto consideration, and I think it should be. Uh, it also matters because at the end of a product life, uh, someone, a, com a competitor or someone else in the landscape might be able to support the product nonetheless. So even if you decide to phase out your product, then the competitor can say, well, we'll offer the same backend support. So all you need to do is point the product at someone else's technology infrastructure. And so you don't feel necessarily like your obligations to that product, to that customers are necessarily a complete failure. Uh, the idea of openness and open source has also been uh, very important for the group. So looking at how much is published uh, in open, under open source licenses uh, of the product that you're developing, we think is very important. Um, it's very important. It might not be very important during the lifetime of your product, but again, at that point of um, discontinuation or failure of the company, which we know does happen because the space is really full of SMEs, um, then you know, at that point of failure saying, actually, I'm gonna open source the product. So I've put here two examples of companies whose products were open sourced and were picked up again years later uh, by a third party. So one is a connected rabbit for families, which was one of the first commercially successful connected products on the market in France in 2004. Um, the other one is again, a connected product for families slash home. And that was picked up again later on by an ad agency. Uh, the data governance of this is also, we think, really important. Uh, do your customers and consumers, really, because your customers might be a wholesaler, um, do your end consumers really understand the uh, implications of disconnecting the product at any point? Do they understand the legal repercussions? Um, and do they understand the ramifications for them, again, legally? Um, I put here an example of a connected car, which is sold to in the US market at the time um, for people who couldn't necessarily afford a traditional leasing uh, program. And so uh, this car, when a payment hasn't been made or is about to be required, there's a buzzer in the car um, that starts to get louder. And eventually on the day of the leasing payment, uh, the car might be disconnected entirely remotely. And so do people really understand that repercussion? And how clear is this when they're actually uh, buying into this product? Um, another aspect which we think is important is that the idea of clarity when it comes to permissions and ownership. Again, with connected home products, it's extremely important to understand that something that you might be installing in a home might not be movable. So in the case of connected thermostats, for example, usually they come um, as part of a package with an energy company, the energy company might not be interested in moving that thermostat to your next home as you move. And so understanding that, understanding that you're making a, uh, an investment really into upgrading this home, but it might not be upgrading your next home. You'll have to reinvest again. Um, allowing people to chop and change how their data is processed if they give the product away, uh, whether that's eBay or on secondary markets. 
uh, being able to give them a factory reset at every point physically is really important. And again, how um, people's data is handled and how clear is that? Um, Paolo talked about security, so I'm not gonna go too much into it, but again, are the work practices that you have really focused on offering security at every level, whether that's the firmware level, uh, the backend uh, development level, uh, and the hardware level. And then finally, um, this is my next to final slide, uh, the idea that uh, life, the life cycle, it's not lifestyle, it's life cycle, uh, and provenance of the product really matters. So um, making sure that the product is easy to fix by common households has started to become really important. Uh, it, it is important in terms of a conversation around climate change. It's important in terms of a conversation about consumerism and about aggressive consumerism, um, even notionally giving people a spare, no matter what, uh, and a spare component for the duration of the service is uh, really important and really difficult right now. It's still something that isn't, uh, again, isn't a natural reflex of the market, uh, but we think is really important. This isn't, all of this is not a sort of, you have to do everything, but you have to consider all of these things. You might deprioritize some things and you might also, uh, some things might not even apply, uh, but we think that not making any decisions around these elements uh, does hurt the user experience, no matter uh, whether someone is suffering as a business from COVID or not, they'll have to pick these things up as we uh, kind of keep going. And consumers are definitely becoming more demanding about security and more aware of the impact of what they buy on climate change. So making small decisions that can help give confidence, uh, we think is really important. Um, so again, uh, betteriot.org. And again, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, we're getting into all the questions now. We've got we've got about 15 minutes. So come back, um, Ian and Paolo. That will be lovely. So lots of questions um, already um, that we've had before the event started. And I think people might start asking some now. We have had one, which I'll get to in a minute. I wanted to ask you though, standardization is one of the most critical hurdles of the IoT evolution. Um, because if, if we don't have global standards, then it's all going to be impossible really to handle. So what are the challenges of that in the EU smart home side of things? Who would like to answer that first? Paolo. Can I, can I start? Maybe I can please, give it a try please. on the standardization because to, to my members, uh, standards are uh, a key component of the current uh, EU legislative architecture. Um, we do believe that legislation uh, should set the aim but standards should be the way to measure how good you got to that aim. And we have uh, SEN, Senelec that are developing standard, that are the European Standardization Organization. It's ETSI that is developing a standard as far as uh, connected uh, and interconnected devices. So the standardization is a key element and uh, we look forward to the European Union to continue this uh, very good track of having uh, the aim set in legislation and having uh, the, the measurement method sets by standards. It's, it's extremely critical. Okay, thank you. Um, Ian, we can't see you. Are you still there? Yes, I'm Lo still here. Lovely, that's good. Just to, to be honest, I, I can't really add much to what Paula said. No, I that's fine. Say, I would say though that the, 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 from from a from a European perspective, sometimes when I look out to the rest of the world, um, let's say the US market, I realise how the European market is is highly regulated compared to the US. But I can see that the Euro, the way that the Europeans look at regulation, and I can see that laundry um, energy level regulation, which is going to come into effect next year. I can see that there are many markets around the world, including China, including Argentina, which certainly are in parallel with the way that Europeans are looking at regulation. So what I'd hope for in the future, and I'm talking very broadly here, is that regulation will become more similar internationally than less similar as, as I have found up to now. And I can see lots of signposts to suggest that we're gonna become more integrated in terms of regulation. Who sets that agenda? I can't talk about that, but I can see certainly very clear signposts that 
world markets becoming more similar than less similar in terms of regulation. Okay, thank you. Um, I just do have a question actually for you, Ian. I think it's for you. Uh, how can semiconductor vendors facilitate AIoT adoption by SDA and MDA companies, so obviously small domestic appliance and major domestic appliance companies? Is um, that your baby? I've, I've, <laughs> I've responded to that directly. Oh, have you? Is like, oh, that was that is such a vast question that it's okay. impossible for me to do it justice in a sentence. So anybody, and we can do this with um, in conjunction with HQTS, anybody who's got any specific questions, I'll get back to you, but probably they need a conversation rather than just a... A, a quick answer it's, i won't do it justice so please get in touch with me and we'll set something up that's fine that's fine so okay i've got another one here what is the government policy and strategy for managing the national security and trade implications of ai are there any trade restrictions that may apply to ai based products <laughs> no maybe, one's maybe i can uh, i can give yeah. it a try to uh, to the to the uh, ai and the link with legislation, uh, the European Union, it will come up with uh, an AI legislation uh, next year. Uh, today, there are no um, limitations uh, clearly to that. Uh, and we have to avoid falling into the trap that EU is over-regulating AI, because that would be a barrier to innovation. There are many relevant applications for AI I will just mention one, the, the robot vacuum cleaner. The robot vacuum cleaner helps us in, in every day's chore and having it equipped with the AI will maximize the battery life because this is gonna clean where most of the dirt is. Very simple application, something that uh, it can uh, learn along the way, something that should be enabled by the European legislation. Can I, can I come in here because please, I think the, um, the vacuum cleaner is very interesting because the most controversial thing about that vacuum cleaner is that the mapping that it makes of people's homes has been sold as data uh, to third parties. And so as it cleans around, it's actually mapping a household and that data in the terms and conditions that we all click through without really thinking about it, or we all agree to as consumers and 30 days after the purchase are no longer particularly protected. Uh, we agree to data being used in algorithmic use uh, of our data uh, in ways that I don't think the consumer has much clarity around. And I don't think, I think that standardization around this space will be an interesting conundrum, which is about standardizing future possible misuse of data. And it's extremely difficult to do that. Really interesting point. Thank you, Paolo, you wanted to say something? Of course, <laughs> because uh, uh, the, the, there is a, a legitimate use of data and there is a, a non-legitimate use of data. What you made reference to, it is definitely a non-legitimate use of data, which I'm sure all our members would uh, highly avoid at all costs, because this is a reputational issue. And there is nothing more precious to my members than their brand. So they would do nothing absolutely nothing that would uh, diminish the value of their brand in the eyes of the consumers as what you just mentioned. So the legitimate use, it is to enhance battery life by going to clean first when there is most uh, uh, like dirt on the floor. That, that's, that's pretty much legitimate. Selling data is not legitimate. Sorry about that. No, fair enough. And there is a question on that that somebody asked, actually, sustainability researchers have always pointed that data monitoring on this is not up to standard. Do we have regulations that stop us yet? Uh, Ian, does someone want to say something? Sorry, I'm just, I'm actually typing a reply to that. Um, not to my knowledge, but what I would say within the energy area, smart grid, smart meters, and the energy signature defragmentation, which sounds like a really complicated sentence, but your washing machine has an energy signature. It can be tracked. So there's a huge amount of information out there which is going to be made available to multiple industries, which mean that we can track energy usage more specifically. It could be anonymized, I guess, but it's, again, it's another massive conversation, which I guess I can't do justice in one sentence. But I would say that 
all the information that I have is that energy is going to be probably snooped upon much more than any other area of our lives. Can I come in here as well? Yeah, of course, of course. So I was head of an uh, innovation for Bulb Energy, which is a renewable energy company in the UK. And what I'd, I'd say about that is that it also, it again, comes down to consumer appreciation and literacy around these issues, because there are multiple vendors in the UK that sell plugs for um, each and every appliance that you have that monitors uh, that particular appliance use. There are ways of disaggregating each appliance, even from one plug at your meter. Um, the consumer isn't interested. The consumer is not interested in being policed about when they put the washing on. And so that is a conundrum, which is a usage conundrum, which is again, a lifestyle conundrum and a household lifestyle conundrum, which is knowing when the grid is busy is everybody's sort of dream for the last 20 years in terms of we can push people to use things in different ways at different times. Consumers are not interested in this, especially if they're in complicated household with a variety of different needs. If your baby needs to be changed and it's the third time today uh, or the last half hour you change it, you're gonna put a wash on. It doesn't matter how green the grid is. And so um, the technical capabilities are there, but how people adopt them and how people have change, change actually their behavior is a really tricky one. That's a really interesting point. We've got so many questions to get through. We're not gonna get through them all. Okay, Paolo, I'll come to you then a couple more questions and then, and then we'll have to, we're, we're only at the end, Paolo. Yes, uh, consumer behavior is extremely important. I, mm. I agree with, uh, with Alexandra on, uh, on that. And, and to us, consumers must have the last word. In, in any case, in any case, whether this is green, is red, is orange, if I wanna take a shower, I wanna take a shower now. Yeah. So consumer behavior matched with the uh, new energy market would be a key issue. I agree, Alexander, totally. Brilliant, thank you. Well, moving on to our question. So there's one about what is the connection between IoT and quality assurance? And obviously, I suppose it's quite relevant to our lovely sponsors, HQTS as well, because surely all this sort of what they offer, the third parties checking the product quality, all this kind of thing, how, does, how important is all of this? Should I come to you on that? Alexandra, can I come to you on that or Paolo? I'm happy to I'm happy to come yeah. in. I think um, it's really interesting to think about what quality means. Again, all the things I talked about are about an ethical set of decision making that means that you're exposing your product to a variety of different risks. And so looking at what quality means and how we assess quality will change. We'll start to look at giving people risk risk assessments that are based on user experience, reputation in case of a sale of the product, in case of the lack of disassembly of that product, et cetera. And I think our uh, version of quality now is one thing and how we will develop it over the course of many years, I think will massively change. Would anybody else want to add something there, you guys? Well, yes, uh, quality is extremely important. And uh, we have uh, different type of, uh, of qualities um, and uh, the, the most relevant one, it is uh, uh, safety, clearly, and, and this is highly regulated. And my point here, it is that safety is and must be ensured online and offline. And any type of uh, hacking must not and must never impair consumer safety. And this is what, what members are actually uh, doing right now. Um, then there is uh, the safety against uh, cybersecurity attack and quality uh, about there, which is also one uh, extremely interesting point. So quality, okay, well, it, uh, it's, uh, it's 100% or 360 degree matter. It is always in the mind of, of members. There's one of the questions was, what's the most important, um, which is the first out of all the elements that you need to be considering, but you you guys have, uh, they're all important really, it's hard to pick one. One question here, for appliance manufacturers, what additional revenue over the lifetime of the product could be gained or consumer stickiness could be achieved with a connected product versus an unconnected product? I mean, that's a big question, but yes, Ian. I can do that. Um, okay, so we do a lot of work at the moment about ecosystems and consumer systems. If you think about the average price of a, a average washing machine globally, 
it's about 500 euros. That's the average price globally for a washing machine. And let's say it lasts for eight years. And the, the, the additives you put in there, the detergent, the softeners, the sanitizer you put in there, over the lifetime of that machine, it is about $500 or euros worth of um, expenditure. So this marriage between the appliance and the consumable uh, through IoT, through connectivity, to give consumers a better result is critical for the future. And I can see that almost every appliance manufacturer, major appliance manufacturers looking at this because they think that actually, and quite rightly, that actually if you marry the detergency and the appliance together, in the case of washing machines, you get a better result. And these two industries have never really talked to each other, surprisingly. And I think it's through connectivity that we're going to get better results for the consumer. And that's important for us in Europe, but it's also important when we start to look at emerging markets. Why should emerging markets not have the best that they can be available, available to them, even on restricted incomes? And I think that this marriage between appliances and consumables is critically important. And it's where all the value is going to come from for connected appliances in the future. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, look, guys, we're, we're literally just past um, 10. So thank you so much to everybody. HQTS is going to be creating more webinars into 2021. So keep watching out for those. And you can watch our previous webinars um, either by going to www.hqts.com or there is a YouTube link, which I've been sharing in the chat, which is too many letters for me to read out now. Any questions at all, please send them to inquiry at hqts.com. And remember, if you put your name and details in the chat now, they will be able to get back to you if you've got any questions. And I think Ian is getting in touch with a few people as well there. So any questions at all, please forward them on. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you so much to Ian, Paolo and Alexandra today for your great presentations. Um, lovely to, to, to see you all and um, ha have a great rest of the week. It's almost finished, isn't it? Happy Friday. Happy Friday, everybody. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.